Hello everyone and welcome to Konos Crash Course Season 2! We're back for another year of history lectures, so strap in and enjoy the ride. If you're new to this channel, what I do is recap Dr. T's history lectures every week to help you guys study for all the quizzes. Uh, plus, for the first six weeks of the school year, I'm going to be doing recaps of the music appreciation lectures at the end of each video in case you need help with that. But just know that while this series is supposed to help you study, it is not supposed to replace you taking notes in class that is still totally required for you to do plus I might make some mistakes in these videos I have before so you should have notes to double check what I say so with all that out of the way let's get into the first lecture and I know this lecture doesn't have a quiz to go with it but I'm gonna go ahead and make a video for each week's lecture so people can rewatch for the finals once we get there so yeah this video I'm still gonna do and plus music appreciation stuff I'm gonna be doing at the end so yeah let's dive right in Alright, so the main topic for this lecture is seen versus unseen, and not really a specific part of history like usual, and there are no words on the board either, so yeah, there's not really a real flow to this lecture. I mean, if you guys are new, don't worry, this isn't like the usual formula. Usually there's like words on the board, and you follow along with a story, like it's usually not like this. To start off, we're going to look at the character box of God, which should be very familiar to returning students since he's basically used this every single first lecture of the year. His attributes are are being sovereign or king, righteous, just, love, eternal life, omniscience, which means he knows everything, omnipresent, which means he's everywhere at once, and omnipotent, which means he's all-powerful. So yeah, the three omnis right there, omniscience, omnipresence, and omnipotence. You can trust him because he absolutely cannot lie, it's impossible for him to lie, and he is unchanging, which means all of these traits are true in the Old and New Testaments and today. He's the same God all the time, everywhere, he's never been different. Alright, now the big question for this lecture. If a man dies, will he live again? It was a question asked by Job, I believe, and Dr. T said it was an important one. Well, according to the Bible, yes, as Jesus offers us life after death in a new body. This is related to the whole seen versus unseen theme because, well, life after death in heaven isn't really something you see. We can't see heaven. Like, you can't just look up in the sky and say, oh, hey, there's heaven. But yeah, so heaven is a real place, even though we can't see it. So are all the other spiritual thingies associated with it. And there are many examples in the Bible where this invisible world appears. So now we're just going to go through all those examples, which was most of the lecture. First off, Jesus was on earth and then was taken up by a cloud. An angel said he'd come back the same way he came. So yeah, I think what that means, like he's going to literally come back in the exact same spot that he went up. So I'm assuming that means somewhere in Israel. I don't think anyone knows a specific place, but... Yeah. Second, Jesus appeared in a closed room, and apparently this has something to do with the uh, tunnel effect, which is where you can calculate the odds of someone walking through a wall, but as you can probably tell, those odds are very, very low, so Jesus is defying the odds with that. Up next is when the Ten Commandments were given to Moses. All the people around the mountain heard this, and there were like millions of people there from what he said. So yeah, all these millions of people were witnesses to this event. They all heard Moses get the Ten Commandments. They were all there, and they all heard it. Next up, Jesus spoke to Paul on the road to Damascus in Hebrew. I, I never could tell why the Hebrew part was important, because didn't Jesus speak Hebrew when he was on earth? I think he did, but I mean, I don't know. There was something important about that, but I couldn't really pick up on that. If you know why it was so important, please let me know in the comments. But yeah, but basically Paul was the only one who heard Jesus speaking. All the other people in his group on that road only saw the bright light. And then Paul relayed this entire story when he was on trial before King Agrippa in Acts 25, I believe. Next up, Peter was delivered from a prison by an angel. He had two chains on him and there were two cards watching him at all times. But then the angel came and his chains simply fell off and he walked out of the prison. The doors opened for him automatically and then after a couple blocks of walking, he was like, wait a minute, this, this isn't a dream. I'm just like, I'm just walking out of prison. Whoa, that, that, that's pretty cool. Then there was uh, the Transfiguration with Jesus, Moses, and Elijah on the mountain. And then there was Elisha in the chariots of fire, where there was the invisible army attacking the opposing forces that were attacking the city. And Elisha opened the eyes of his servants so he could see the entire invisible army of ch fire chariot things attacking all the bad guys. So yeah! Last up is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and I feel like I could not tell the story any better than this clip right here. So, 
as you can see, the unseen world has broken into the seen world many times, and it still does, because the Bible says whenever people gather to pray, God is there. Also, in regards to science and the unseen world, many people in the Middle Ages said that Jesus was up there, pointing above them. But when modern Newtonian science arrived, they said it was out there, referring to space. But now with Einsteinian science, he, he never actually said what they say now, but I'm assuming something like a, a, an alternate dimension, maybe? I mean, that, that, that's what I've always thought, at least. But yeah, many of the big scientists we know were Christians, like all the big famous ones, but the evil worldly people don't want you to know that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they, they were Christians, though. So yeah, the more you know. And that's it for history. It was a pretty simple lecture. There wasn't really much to go over, and there's no quiz either. But hey, this stuff might reappear on the finals, and we are writing that letter thing about it this week. So at least be familiar with the material. That'd probably be smart. Okay, now on to music appreciation, but before I begin, I must personally thank Savannah Pollard for playing All Star in class. I don't know if that was just on Thursday or not, but it was incredible. Please do it every class. Thank you so much. <laughs> so, we start with the origin of Western music, which was in ancient Greece from around 400 to 1450 AD. I know it's a huge time gap, but we actually only have around 45 surviving pieces of music from that time period, and the only one remaining in full is the Epitapha of Sect. I probably mispronounced that, so please forgive me, but you'll notice that mispronouncing things is a running theme on this channel, so deal with it. <laughs> Next is Renaissance music, which was in the 1400s and 1500s. The main composition types around this time were motets and madrigals, both of which often consisted of an a cappella made up of four singers, but the main difference between motets and madrigals was that motets were more sacred spiritual songs. After that is the Baroque period, commonly associated with big or grand music. It was from around 1600 to 1750. Art and architecture around this time was very elaborate, and so was the music. It consisted of things like trills, grace notes, turns, and rapid scale passages. The main instruments were the organ, the clavichord, and the harpsichord. The clavichord and the harpsichord were basically the same instrument, but the clavichord was smaller and meant for personal use, while the harpsichord is bigger and designed for public use. And they both sounded a bit more hard on the ears than a grand piano, so it's not as like nice sounding, like it's a bit more sharp. But I still think it sounded pretty cool actually. And um, the main composers in the Baroque period were Bach, Handel, Scarlatti, and Vivaldi. Those are the last names, no first names. Next we're going to cover oratorios and operas. Oratorios are unstaged musical plays often based on Bible stories, and they consist of solos, ensembles, and choruses. All of it is sung, no dialogue, no costumes, no props, they just sing the whole thing, that's it. Famous example of this is Handel's Messiah. Then there are operas, which are staged dramatic plays, and they are still sung the entire way through, but they have a flowing story to go with them. And they are more secular in their storylines, but again, that's not a Bad thing, it just means they're not really religious based, and they have costumes and props and all that jazz. It's like a full on play, just the entire thing sung. Final topic is Bach, who lived from 1685 to 1750. Many say his death ended the Baroque period, he was German, he was considered the best composer in this period. He was mainly known as an organ virtuoso, which means like, yeah, he just mainly played the organ. He had two wives at different times, so don't worry, and then 20 children combined, just 20, 20 kids, ah! He was very passionate about the church, and he was quoted saying that the aim of music is to glorify God and refresh the spirits. Amen to that. Okie dokie, that, that's everything. So yeah, if you have any questions about the material for history or music appreciation, feel free to leave a comment below and I'll see if I can get back to you. Also, please tell me if I messed up any of the facts. I don't want to be feeding you guys incorrect information. So yeah, that's it. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you guys next week.